Well, now let's cross to Abuja, where the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, Godwin Emifile, is briefing the media after the two-day monetary policy meeting. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the Monetary Policy Committee met on the 20th and 21st of March 2023, faced with new and existing headwinds, undermining the full recovery of the global economy. These include the recent bank failures in the United States and Switzerland amidst widespread monetary policy tightening, which introduced a new dimension to the risk confronting the global financial system, as well as the persisting high birth receding global inflation. The continued hostilities between Russia and Ukraine and its implication to the smooth functioning of the global supply chain also remain a critical strain to the recovery of the global output growth. In the domestic economy, output recovery progressed at a relatively moderate pace, while headline inflation trended upwards, albeit less aggressively, driven mainly by a marginal increase in food inflation. The committee assessed key risks to the global economy associated with these developments and their impact on the Nigerian economy as well as the outlook for the rest of the year. Twelve members of the committee attended this meeting, Global Economic Development. The Monetary Policy Committee noted the new and existing headwinds to the broad stability of the global economy. Primary amongst these is the risk of a global financial contagion from the recent bank failure in the United States and Switzerland. In Europe, the war between Ukraine, war with Russia and Ukraine has continued unabated, causing critical strains to the commodities and energy markets as supply chain bottlenecks remain, while the lingering risk of the resurgence of several variants of coronavirus persists after China set aside its zero COVID policy. Furthermore, the deteriorating relations between the US, China, Russia, and some major oil producers in the Middle East continue to contribute to increased volatility in the oil markets. In the emerging markets and developing economies, the unfolding tight external financing conditions and shock spillovers from the advanced economies could further dampen the recovery of output growth. In the light of this development, the International Monetary Fund IMF in its January 2023 World Economic Outlook forecast global output growth for 2023 at 2.9% compared with 3.4% in 2022. Growth is however expected to, to improve to 3.1% in 2024. While global inflation shows signs of deceleration, monetary policy normalization is progressing unabated, especially amongst key advanced economy central banks, targeted at moderating global demand pressure. Price development across several economies is thus expected to remain high throughout 2023, but begin to decelerate gradually in 2024. The key factors expected to keep inflation above the long-run target of several central banks include the persistent disruption to energy markets associated with continued war between Russia and Ukraine, high commodity prices and general disruptions to the global supply chain associated with uncertainties around the COVID-19 pandemic in China and the ongoing tensions between the United States and China over Taiwan's sovereignty. Across several emerging markets and developing economies, inflationary pressure has remained high due largely to rising energy prices, high prices of grains, and exchange rate pressures associated with capital flows to high yield US dollar denominated assets. In the global financial markets, renewed fears of a global financial contagion are forcing investors to move away from the equities market to safer assets such as gold, while others seek higher returns in treasury securities with improved yields. With associated advanced 
With the several advanced economy central banks progressing with monetary policy normalization, global financial conditions will likely remain tight, thus reinforcing the reassessment of financial portfolios to reflect the risk aversion of investors. Domestic development. Data from the National Bureau of Statistics show that the real gross domestic product GDP grew by 3.1% in 2022. During the fourth quarter of 2022, it grew by 3.52% year on year compared with 3.98% in the corresponding period of 2021 and 2.25% in the preceding quarter. The economy remained a, po remained a positive growth traje the trajectory for nine consecutive quarters while exiting recession in 2022, since exiting recession in 2020, 2020. The improved performance was driven largely by sustained growth in the services and agricultural sectors, rebound in economic activities associated with economic recovery and continued intervention in growth enhancing sectors by the bank. Staff projections showed that output growth recovery is expected to continue into 2023 and 2024. The committee, however, observed with concern the marginal increase in headline inflation year on year in February 2023 to 21.91% from 21.82% in January 2023, a 0.09% point increase. This increase was attributed largely to a minimal rise in food component to 24.35% in February 2023 from 24.32% in January 2023, while the core component moderated to 18.84% in February 2023 from 19.16% in January 2023. The shocks to the food component were driven by the high cost of transportation of food items, lingering security challenges in the major food producing areas and legacy infrastructural problems which continued to hamper food supply logistics. Broad money supply entry grew by 13.14% annualized in February 2023 year to year below the 2023 provisional annual benchmark of 17.18%. This was driven largely by the growth in net foreign assets which was attributed to the increase in foreign assets holdings of the central bank and decrease in foreign claims on other depository corporations. Money market rates reflected the tight, li tight liquidity conditions in the banking system. Consequently, the monthly weighted average open by all rates increased to 12.74% and 12.54% in February 2023 from 10.14% and 10.35% in January 2023 respectively. The committee noted the continued stability in the banking system reflected by the performance of the financial standards indicators. The capital adequacy ratio stood at 13.7%, non-performing loans NPL ratio of 4.2%, and liquidity ratio of 43.1% as of February 2023. The MPC observed the sustained improvement in the equities market in the review period as the all share index and the market capitalization both increased to 54,915.39 and 29.92 trillion naira on March 17, 2023 from 51,251.06 and 27.92 trillion naira on December 30, 2022 respectively indicating renewed investor confidence in the Nigerian financial market. The committee, however, noted the bachelor decline in the level of gross external reserves to $36.13 billion in February 2023 from $36.14 billion in January 2023, a decrease of 0.7% reflecting the downtrend in crude oil prices as global uncertainties persist. The committee reviewed the performance of the bank's various interventions aimed at stimulating production and productivity across the real sector. Between January and February of 2023, the bank disbursed 12.65 billion naira to three agricultural projects under the Anchor Program 
bringing the cumulative disbursement under the program to 1.09 trillion to over 4.6 million smallholder farmers, cultivating or rearing 21 agricultural commodities on an approved on an approved 6.02 million hectares of farmland across the country. The bank also released the sum of 23.7 billion under the 1 trillion naira rail sector support facility to eight new rail sector projects in agriculture, manufacturing and services. Cumulative disbursements under the rail sector facility currently stands at 2.43 trillion disbursed to 462 projects across the country comprising 257 manufacturing, 95 agriculture, 97 services and 13 mining sector projects. Under the 100 for 100 policy on production and productivity, the bank also released 3 billion naira under the Nigerian Electricity Market Civilization Facility for capital and operational expenditure of distribution companies' discos aimed at improving their liquidity status in and aid their recovery of legacy debt. This brings the cumulative disbursement under the facility to 254.39 billion naira our outlook. The overall outlook for the full recovery of both the global and domestic economies remained clouded by new and legacy downside risks. Available data and forecast for key macroeconomic variables for the Nigerian economy suggest that the domestic economy will continue to recover for the rest of 2023 at a moderate pace in light of evolving and persistent shocks to the economy. The continued upward pressure on inflation, rising cost of debt and debt servicing, as well as deteriorating fiscal balances remain headwinds which may undermine the smooth path to a faster recovery. Accordingly, Nigerian economy is forecast to grow in 2023 by 3.03% CBN estimate, 3.37% federal government estimate, and 3.2% the IMF estimate. The committee's consideration. At this meeting, the Monetary Policy Committee focused its attention not only on the inflationary trends in most major economies in the world, but also on the reported impact of, of policy rate hikes aimed at reining in inflation on financial system stability in the global financial system. MPC hence took time out to discuss the recent bank failures in the US and Switzerland and, and an event that occurred following the persistent interest rate hikes in the USA and how this has adversely impacted the broad portfolio of banks in the United States. It noted that whereas NPR has increased by 500 basis points in Nigeria, from 12.5% in 2022 to 17.5% in January 2023, the financial stability indi indicators in Nigeria shows that the Nigerian banking system remains resilient due largely to the stringent prudential guidelines put in place by the CBN, which has resulted in a strong buildup of not only the cash reserve re re ratio deposit in Nigeria, but also liquidity ratio and capital adequacy ratios. In the light of these strong financial stability indicators, MPC was com comforted that its various decisions in increasing monetary policy rate has had positive impact on inflation given that inflation rate had started to decelerate in Nigeria. The committee's major considerations at this meeting, therefore, focus on arriving at key policy mechanisms to shield the economy from emerging shocks from the global economy as well as sustain its focus on domestic price stability. Headline inflation in the view of members remain high with increased expectations of price development due to the perennial scarcity of PMS and ongoing discourse around the removal of wealth subsidy with the prices of other energy products also rising, members stressed the importance of addressing price development. 
committee also considered the continued impact of exchange rate pressure on domestic price levels and called for policies to attract both portfolio and foreign direct investments to Nigeria. It maintained optimism that the continued progress made with the RT200 FX program, the Naira for dollar and other policies targeted at attracting diaspora remittances would continue to help improve accretion to the external reserves and improve liquidity in the foreign exchange market. While output growth remains on a positive trajectory, member co members call for increased monetary and fiscal coordination to support the recovery in the light of risk confronting the domestic economy. To this end, committee and joint fiscal authority to explore other avenues to improve non-oil revenue to reduce the fiscal deficit and public debt. Following new risk of financial contagion emerging from the scenario of failed banks in some advanced economies, members examine critically the possibility of shocks to the Nigerian banking system from these banks and concluded that the Nigerian banking system remains reasonably insulated from such likely contagion. The bank has been able to achieve this through stringent micro and macro prudential guidelines that has ensured that individual banks and the banking industry in Nigeria have adequate buffers to ward off, to ward off global contagion. In addition to this, MPC examined the possible impact of further policy rate hikes on the stability of the banking system and was convinced that further rate hikes would not adversely impact the stability of the banking system. Committee however called on the bank's management to strengthen its regulatory oversight on the banking system to ensure that the banking industry remains stable and resilient. The MPC, the decision, MPC noted that while the continued rise in headline inflation remained a significant problem confronting the economy, other macroeconomic variables were moving in the right direction despite observed headwinds. The committee's debate at this meeting therefore was whether to continue to, re re to continue its rate hike to further dampen the rising inflation trajectory or hold observe or hold to observe emerging development and allow for impact of the last five rate hikes to permeate the economy. Loosening in the view of the members would gravely undermine the gains so far achieved. MPC observed the continued upward risks to price development around expectations on the removal of the PMS subsidy, rising prices of other energy sources, continued exchange rate pressure, and uncertain climatic conditions. These, in the view of members, provides a compelling argument for an upward adjustment of policy rates, albeit less aggressively. Committee however noted that the narrow redesign and cash withdrawal limit policies have resulted in a sizable reduction in currency outside the banks, indicating expected improvement in the potency of monetary policy tools. Members, however, remained aware of the ongoing challenges associated with the limits imposed on cash withdrawals in the face of frequent downtime in bank, in bank electronic transaction channels. Committee thoughts called on the other depository corporations, online payment platforms, and other stakeholders to ensure that the prevailing incidence of network failures is overcome in the immediate and short term. This would ensure that the Naira redesign and cash withdrawal policies lead to an improved inroad of the CBN cashless policy program and efficiency of the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. Members thus resolved by a majority vote to raise the monetary policy rate NPR by 50 basis points. In summary, 10 members voted to raise NPR by 50 basis points, one member voted to raise NPR by 25 basis points, and one member voted to hold the NPR. All members voted to keep all other parameters constant. The MPC therefore voted as follows. One, raise the NPR to 18.18%. Two, retain the asymmetric corridor at plus 100 and minus 500 basis points around the NPR. Three, retain the CRR at 32.5%. And four, retain liquidity ratio at 30%.
And thank you for your attention. Thank you, no, no. That was monetary policy community number one round for the seven read by the government. We have some questions from the media. Um, I think um, my concern is on the, the uh, public education, which you're uh, saying I think that what you're going to in the view of education. So, um, is there any um, mm -hmm. oh, good, are there any measures that you see here is possibly exploring or you know looking at in you know, them measuring pressures that we're saying? See that inflation has been increasing now for two consecutive weeks. That's what you want to right? Yes, for business. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sandy Michael. I write for the Daily Trust newspaper. Mr. Um, Governor, following your acknowledgement of uh, what had happened in the United States with the SDB and the impact in Switzerland, I was wondering uh, when you said the committee had evaluated and uh, confidence it would not have um, impact on our system. But I would like you to please expand on that. Uh, uh, the level of exposure of Nigeria to the Special Estate, especially Stalin, uh, to the SDB. Thank you. Level of Nigeria's exposure to SDB. Zero. Good afternoon, Mr. Governor. I'm Nancy Nagy. Good afternoon, members of the My question is. With the aftermath of the Supreme Court's uh, judgment on the uh, legal tender status of 200 and 500 and 1,000 and also in lines with the bank statements last week, I really like to know what is the state of the country's money supply. These are these that a lot of Nigerians are still cash squeezed, and we have many failures concerning banking transactions as well as online transactions. Thank you. Good afternoon, Governor. I'm Mr. Nibos. My name is Gary from Nigeria. Findings have shown that a lot of people are trying to support their kids of the cashless policy. But the problem of uh, the seamless uh, network for uh, this connectivity has been a problem and very frustrating this policy. What is the signal going to bring this payment? Okay. We have two questions from outside. Mukola Ido of Leadership Newspaper sent this. Governor, sir, the bank in the process of carrying out its campaign on adopting the newly redesigned banknotes also encouraged Nigerians to embrace the e -Naira. What is the adoption rate of the e naira thus far? Another question from Baba Gide Komala from Banga Newspaper. At the recent conference of Central Bank Governors and Financial Regulators held in Jogo, South Africa, you were reported to have advised banks to ensure tighter regulations to guard against the wrong on the banks. Can you take us through the systemic health status of Nigerian banks? Thank you. Very much. Well, thank you very much uh, for those questions. I think uh, the first question uh, from Ian bordered on uh, the fact that uh, she said that the latest figures from National Bureau of Statistics uh, indicate an upward trend in inflation, with inflation standard at 21.9 as of February 2023. And what other strategies are there left for the Monetary Policy Authority to reverse this trend? Well, first, I think we must appreciate the fact that um, between April 2022 and August 2022, we're seeing um, a very steep rise, a very steep slope in the rate of increase in inflation rate in Nigeria. The rate of acceleration was quite steep. But by around May, from the May meeting when we began to, when the global pressures on inflation um, began to show real signs globally, 
we also started to raise MPR, albeit in an attempt to tame the aggressive rise in inflation. And what we saw is that because of the action that we have taken, the rate of increase in prices, which is inflation, has had begun to decelerate. For instance, um, between April and 20, between April and August, the rate of increase in inflation was about five percent. But between August and even now, the rate of increase in inflation is only about 1.4 percent. Right? Because of the tightening measures that have been adopted by the CBN over this period, which yes, one would have what one would expect is that um, because we're tightening, inflation should immediately begin to, to drop. It doesn't happen that way. What you will find, particularly in our environment, is that as you are tightening and you see or before you start tightening and you see inflation moving very aggressively and you begin a policy of tightening, what you want to do first of all is to stem that rate of increase before you begin to see a reduction. Once you achieve a stem, once you achieve the kind of moderation in the rate of increase of inflation, the next thing you're gonna, gonna, gonna begin to see is that it should begin to come down as you, be, as you continue your tightening, tightening policy. That is what we're doing. Whereas you will see that the transmission mechanism in some economies is that it's almost direct. As you are tightening, you are seeing inflation trending downwards immediately. But it differs, the rate of response differs from one economy to another economy. The Monetary Policy Committee was comforted at this meeting that the fact that the tightening measures had started to reduce the rate of, the rate of increase in prices, which is inflation, we believe that as we continue this process, that inflation will eventually begin to trend downwards. Are we optimistic that, for instance, this March meeting, are we optimistic that by May, inflation would have started to trend downwards? No, we're not that optimistic for a range of factors. Whether we like it or not, between now and May, or the end of this administration, we expect that subsidy will disappear. Subsidy removal has its own implication on prices, which is inflation. So we are, because monetary policy is not optimistic that pri prices will, con will continue to come down because of these measures, well, monetary policy feels that we need to continue to tighten. And that's what we did at this meeting. What would also continue to be the strategy? The important thing is for us to continue to look at what is the margin between policy rate and inflation the margin between policy rate and inflation has remained wide, which is negative real rate. And in economics, when you find negative real rate, it is a disincentive to even investment. And so everything has to continue to be put in place by monetary policy authorities to see that we, we reduce that margin or that gap in the negative real rate by ensuring that inflation comes down. And whatever needs to be done, to rein in inflation, we have to continue to do so. So that will continue to be the strategy, but we'll do it more moderately going forward because we are conscious of the fact that when you over tighten, just like we have seen in, some, uh, in the US and in Switzerland, that it could begin to have contagion effect and negative impact on banking system and financial soundness indicators and financial system stability in an economy. So those are the kind of balance that we're looking at at monetary policy to see that, well, whereas we want to continue to tighten so as to rein in inflation, we must do it in such a moderate manner that we try to achieve the moderation in inflation rate, but at the same time without creating financial system instability in our economy. Unfortunately, that is where we are because of the uncharted territory that we have found ourselves arising from various geopolitical tensions that we have seen all over the world. So what am I saying in summary? The strategy would be 
how do we reduce the gap in negative real rate? To reduce that gap in negative real rate, we will continue to tighten, albeit moderately, to ensure that we achieve the level of inflation, which may rather not be over a somewhat prolonged period of time, so that if you do it more aggressively, it could have some negative impact on banking system stability and financial system in indicators, financial soundness indicators. So that will be the strategy. It's a difficult balance, but that is the job we have to do and we have to make sure we do it um, correctly. Um, the second question talked about um, the fact that we should please try and look at the level of exposure of Nigeria, Nigeria's financial system, especially startup in the SVP. Like I said earlier, um, immediately this happened last week. We, we, we taxed our banking supervision department to ask for the bond portfolios, which is the main area of, uh, a main area of investment um, of banks in order, to, in order to earn some relatively high yield. And what that came back to us is that there, there is no um, direct investment by Nigerian banks in SVB that could result in a loss of investment there. That's on one part. But on the, other second, on the second part, we began to say, how do we, how are we sure that the Nigerian, Nigerian banking system is reasonably insulated to ensure that what happened in the United States does not happen in Nigeria? So we reviewed um, the various prudential guidelines we are put in place. Nigeria, like I said in my discussion when I went to Jogo, Nigeria, being one of the countries, is one of the countries or few few countries in the world where we have cash reserve deposit requirement. What is cash deposit requirement? It has been there even before I started banking. That when you deposit your money in a bank, a certain percentage of that deposit is held or serialized at the Central Bank of Nigeria to ensure that when there are kind of liquidity crises, that, that money is available for, to that bank for them to use to solve that liquidity problem so that depositors don't lose their money. Two, we also have the liquidity ratio, which is an indices of specified liquid assets against total deposits of banks, either held in cash in bank vault or bank balances or money at call, treasury bills, Open, uh, homo, homo bills and different other liquid instruments. And in Nigeria, the ratio is a minimum of 30%. Banks keep above that. Today, liquid ratio is almost about cash reserve. We all know, just like we read, is about 32.5%. The loan deposit ratio, which means that banks are not over trading. Is just about about 52.47 percent. But we are happy that, in spite of maintaining these prudentials, that the banks still remain profitable. The ROIs, the, uh, the return on equities or return on uh, uh, the profitability profitability ratios have remained, I would say, relatively strong. Even though when banks convert those profitability from naira to dollar, they look they seem weaker, but at the same time. The Nigerian banks have continued to make profit and they have continued to pay good dividend to their shareholders. So, in sum, we will say that um, the Central Bank of Nigeria has put in place prudential guidelines, guidelines, prudential regulations or guidelines that have, that have insulated the Nigerian banking industry from this kind of risk that we see or contagion that we see or we saw last week in the United States. Nigeria, again, is one of those countries in the world where even after a bank has declared profit and paid taxes, a, a certain percentage of its profit must be set aside in order to build retained earnings and, and capital. If you're a small bank, it's going to be 25%. One quarter of whatever profit you made is set aside and built into what we call the statutory reserve fund in order to improve the capital of that bank. If you're a big bank, then it is reduced to 15% of your profit after tax that is held back to build your retained earnings and your statutory reserve fund 
towards, and towards ensuring that your capital adequacy ratio remains strong. So I believe we've done well. Most banks are unhappy when this issue of cash reserve ratio comes up or they tell their customers, the central bank has done and done that. But I think, I think at this time, people should now come to realization that there is good reason for putting this in place. And today is a day of reckoning where we are looking at that and say, thank God we have these prudential guidelines that have helped to insulate Nigerian banks from the kind of contagion that we've seen in the United States and Switzerland since last week. Um, Nancy said that in the aftermath of the Supreme Court judgment, uh, what is the current status of uh, money supply and all that? Uh, money supply has various components, but I think what is important that I think you'll be looking at is the currency in circulation. Before um, the Naira design, we said there were about three point, there was about 3.23 trillion Naira in circulation, out of which only 500 billion Naira is, was being held in the banking system, and 2.73 2.72 trillion was being held outside the banking uh, system. And with the Naira redesign, um, current, and it was published even in the newspaper yesterday, current in circulation is roughly close to a trillion Naira. And um, CBN continues to pump um, the new, newly designed currency into the market. But the truth is at some point, we will need to reassess again to know whether um, the currency in circulation has attained an optimal level uh, so as to be able to put in place measures that will ensure that um, we don't go back to what we had before where people were keeping uh, a lot of money outside the banking system uh, for their own personal benefits and the rest of them. Four, um, there are I don't know, the findings by um, the media indicate that a good number of Nigerian banks are actually uh, yeah, they are support, Nigerians are in support of the cash flow policy, but of course they saw that um, why they are going into the cashless, which is like adopting alternative channels other than cash, that some of the online, online channels did fail. I must apologize, yes, online channels failed, but know that it was a result of the deluge of volume of online transactions that hit the banking industry. And I think it's currently being resolved and we are following up on daily basis our payment system, uh, payment, payment system management department follows up on a consistent and daily basis with the bank to ensure that where there are downtime, they are resolved as quickly as possible so as to make sure transactions, um, transactions go smoothly. I know that some of, some of, uh, some of, uh, uh, some of our Nigerians will say that this, some of them have persisted but those are very, very isolated cases where I will see that they have persisted. That everything is being done. But of course, I think at this stage, um, I must really thank uh, some of the fintechs, some of our fintechs who have some idle capacity, um, have been able to use those idle capacity to, to boost their online payments, and they have made a lot of money from that because online payment on the, in the fintech sector has actually improved, increased quite astronomically, and we are happy that rather than relying on just only the banks, we have many other channels through which online banking, online payment services can be done so that Nigerians don't suffer because we're insisting that we have to go um, cashless. Um, Bukola Sector so, says that the process of carrying out the campaign for the adoption of E-Naira, um, what is the adoption rate of the E-Naira? I can only say that um, the adoption rate continues to increase and improve, and um, um, everything is being done to continue um, to, to, to make sure that this continues to go up. For instance, um, the eNara, the report that we have shows that the eNara has emerged as the electronic payment channel of choice for financial inclusion and targeted social intervention programs. Within the last 18 months, when the ENRI was launched, we recorded over 13 million wallets. And these wallets are categorized based on their level of usage, with 12.6 million at tier 0, 11,354 at tier 1, 367,000 
at tier 2 and 9,649 at tier 3. But one notable example of areas where the e-Naira has been adopted, and I think we must thank them, is the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management and Social Development, which has expressed keen interest in our e-Naira product. For instance, as on March the 20th, which was just two days ago, approximately 4 million wallets were, were created, especially for social intervention payments represent about 30% of the total wallets created so far. These wallets were created in response to a request from the Ministry as part of plans for the next tranche of the conditional cash transfer program, which is scheduled during the second quarter of 2023. There are other very nice, good and encouraging data uh, that we've seen. Like I said, number of e-wallets created is about 13 million Naira, 13 million of them. The value of e-Naira transactions um, has reached almost 20, 22 billion Naira, um, which is a 68% increase since the beginning uh, of this year. Um, over 10 billion Naira of it had been minted, and then um, about 3.429 billion Naira um, of it is currently um, in circulation. So I would say we've seen good progress in the adoption of e-Naira, and we're happy that as we move, as we try to move more and more towards financial inclusion, and uh, get people away from being explained from the financial system, that the NRA remains one, um, one very, very portable option uh, for you to adopt um, the cashless policy. Um, that at a recent conference in South Africa, CPM government, right, um, and you are and this asking that I was voted to have advised Nigerian banks to ensure tighter regulations, not just Nigerian banks, banks generally, to guard against the run of the bank. Uh, can you explain, can you take us to the systemic health um, health status of the Nigerian Bank in those? I think I have some data here. Like I said, that we had put in place some, um, we put in place a couple of prudential, prudential guidelines to insulate the Nigerian Bank. And that we say, and make bold to say that the financial, financial soundness indicators in Nigeria, in the Nigerian banking industry, shows that Nigerian banks remain very, very resilient, not just resilient, but very, very resilient compared to what we find in other uh, clients. For instance, capital adequacy ratio, which is meant to be between 10 and 15 percent, today is, a, is about 13.7 percent. Non-performing loans ratios have dropped to 4.2 percent. Liquidity ratio is about 43 percent. Um, return on equity is at least 21 percent, which we think is reasonable. And um, like I said, NPLs at 4.2. Cash reserve today, aside from the special special, special bills that we are keeping, we are today holding close to about 14 trillion naira in cash reserve deposit uh, from banks. This is good liquidity that is meant to actually um, act as insulation, just in case of a, of a problem. Also, on the loan deposit ratio. The banks today are just at 52.7%, which means they are not over trading. They are diversifying their portfolio to ensure um, that, um, that they have ample liquidity or ample um, zero risk investments or securities where they make money, but at the same time, depositors' funds remain uh, protected. What we saw at the aftermath of the SVB program in the United States is that the government came out to say, the United States government, President Biden himself came out to say that no deposit, that all depositors of SVB or um, the other bank, that they will confine all, they will be paid all their monies, notwithstanding the fact that what is secured, I mean, what is guaranteed is $250,000. This is something that even in Nigeria we have been doing on our own due to, from collab, either as a result of certain guidelines put in place, prudential guidelines put in place by the CBN, or as a result of collaboration between the CBN and the banks. You know, um, we have made sure that even when banks are taken over by the CBN, that whereas the shareholders may lose their investment. There are no depositor, as far as I know, since 2008 has lost its deposit in Nigerian banking industry today. Not one. It is because we insist 
that yes shareholder i mean shareholders today from our own standpoint in cbn are seen to be less important than depositors in fact we've gotten to a realm where we're beginning to see that banks are owned by depositors not by shareholders because if you look at the balance sheet of an average five-year-old bank today the size of depositors funds is at least close to between seven to ten times of shareholders funds and that's why we come out very strongly when we find depositor i mean shareholders misbehaving in banks we do not spare them because we will continue to repeat that the banking license is a privilege it is not a right the banking license is the property of the Central Bank of Nigeria that can be withdrawn at any time once we find that the shareholders are misbehaving. This is a, 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 a policy that the Central Bank has held on to even before I became the governor of CBN. And I know that even now or even after I would have left office, that whoever will be the governor of Central Bank will insist that the shareholders cannot continue to have the kind of right they think they have to run a bank anyhow, run them aground, and make depositors lose their deposit. We we'll would rather, we'll rather dispense with the shareholders than make sure that depositors do not lose their deposits. So I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr.